Hello everyone, my name is Hans Doctor. I'm the founder of Gradle and I welcome you to this uh, webinar today from our Gradle office in San Francisco. The topic is uh, developer productivity engineering and I hope you will enjoy it. We talk about the case for developer productivity engineering, the importance of fast feedback cycles and how to uh, make developers more productive with fewer incidents and, and better support. Those are the three main topics for today. So let's start uh, with the case for developer productivity engineering. What is very important to understand, right, is, and, and we all know that, right, software development is a creative process. But it's less the creativity of an artist, it's more the creativity of a scientist. Right? A scientist has a hypothesis and then enters a dialogue with nature via experiments to see whether this hypothesis is correct or not, right? And, and that, that influences then his thinking about the world, right, and about how to model it. And for, engineer, for software developers and software engineers, it's similar, but the dialogue is with the tool chain, right? So our hypothesis is a code change, and then we ask the tool chain, which means the compiler, check style, unit tests, performance tests, uh, integration tests, or the running software itself. We need the feedback to see whether this code change is doing the right thing. And uh, the quality of the creative flow of a developer depends a lot on the quality of the dialogue with the tool chain. That includes uh, how fast you get a response and how correct the response is. And ideally, you get answers instantaneously, right? And the answers are always reliable. So that was kind of, I guess for many of us, uh, uh, the world uh, uh, when we started doing coding, right? We had our development environment, right? And, and, uh, uh, and when we changed the color of the circle from red to blue, we saw that change immediately. And this, this instantaneous response from the tool chain was, was pivotal, right? To, 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 have this, to have this creative flow and really got, to really get hooked up on, on software development. Uh, and one question would be interesting to think about if it would have taken five minutes for the circle to change the color, how many would have continued with, with coding, right? Maybe, maybe quite a few would have lost uh, the joy and would have never uh, taken this up as a profession. But things have changed, right? Now we, uh, we, we're developing software in bigger teams. We are doing enterprise software development. And that is creating a unique set of challenges we haven't had before, right? So, so one is uh, that, that there is a new dialogue, right? That is entering our work. That dialogue is about collaboration. We, we need to have a collaboration with the business experts and customer. And we interpret their ideas via code. And we need fast feedback cycles, right? And we need... Uh, to have an effective dialogue with the business expert and or the customer to see whether our interpretation right, of the idea is what they had in mind. And again, the effectiveness of that collaboration depends on how quickly you can iterate. And again, the tool chain is pivotal here, how quickly those iterations uh, can be. So when you, when you think about uh, team productivity, the productivity uh, uh, of your software development team right, is, is, is determined by uh, the quality of the creative flow uh, of your developers and the collaborative effectiveness, right? And, and the reality is that both of those are heavily influenced by the tool chain. And when you do enterprise software development in, in, in medium or, or larger teams, right, the developer tool chain is, is very complex machinery with complex inputs. It affects the speed of iterations, the feedback cycles, and the reliability of the feedback. So, when you do enterprise software development, the tool chain efficiency is a key enabler of creative flow and collaborative effectiveness. If the tool chain efficiency is very low, right, there's, uh, there's not much you can do. You, you, will, you will have not a good creative flow and you will not have good collaborative effectiveness regardless anything else you might be doing to improve that. I have worked with closely over the last years with hundreds right, of, of uh, build teams and uh, uh, developer productivity teams. And what I can say is that uh, the tool chain efficiency ranges from mediocre to bad to terrible, right? That's what we see. We, we, we don't see good or very good, right? And, and so what can we do about this to change that? And one thing that is very important to keep in mind, as your project is getting successful, it, it severely puts pressure on the tool chain, right? Lines of code, number of developers, number of repositories, number of dependencies, 
the diversity of your tech stack is all growing often exponentially. And if you don't take active measures to uh, make your tool chain efficiency scale with that, it will collapse. And the, the return you will, you will get from all those investments, investing more into your development, will, will become marginal because of the reverse effects it has on a tool chain. So that is something, even if you think you're in okay shape right now, you're kind of mediocre right now, as you're growing, it will turn bad and it will turn terrible if you don't do something about it. So to address that, right, we need the discipline of developer productivity engineering. It's not like, it's not a completely new thing, right, in, in the respect, some of that work is already done in many organizations, but very often it's not a clear focus. So what we need, right, to practice this discipline is a team of experts whose sole focus is on optimizing the effectiveness of the developer tool chain. And their objectives are a high degree of automation, right? If you don't, if things are not automated, you cannot accelerate them, you cannot make them more reliable, that, that, that's the worst state to be in, right? So you need a high degree of automation, you want fast feedback cycles, and you want correctness of the feedback. And if there is no clear responsibility for that, if there's not a dedicated effort, you will have the opposite, 100%. Right. No, this doesn't happen automatically or doesn't happen as a side job. If you want to achieve those three objectives, you have to have people that, that have a dedicated focus on that. And you need a culture where the whole organization commits to an effort to improve developer productivity, where uh, you can have a reasonable discussion about uh, uh, maybe disabling the virus scanner for the build output directory. Right? And very, very important, the priorities and success criteria for developer productivity engineering is primarily based on data that comes from a fully instrumented tool chain, right? It's not based on who complains the loudest, on some gut feeling. Tool chains are way, way too complex, right? And if you, if you don't have data, you, you will not be able to do uh, the right thing. Having said that, I'm curious, we wanna do a poll, and I wanna ask the first question, what are the most challenging difficult parts in your build process. And that's typically what we are seeing, right? Slow build test times is, uh, is often the number one problem. And, but the other also very important problem is build reliability, debugging time, finding resolving dependencies belongs in that area. That is basically the other 50%. So that is in, in sync what we, what we usually see. Great, thank you. Because of those issues, right? Slow build test time, debuggability issues, all, this kind, all those tool chain issues we will dive into more detail, is the reason why development teams work far from their true potential. Uh, so there is a significant gap between the actual productivity of software development teams and what they would be able to do if the tool chain were more efficient. And the gap, as already mentioned, is growing over the lifetime of a project for most organizations. And we have seen it many times, the gap can be significantly reduced with the practice of developer productivity engineering, having a clear focus. And I just want to share a story, right? It sounds so, so obvious that you have to do that, but what we see many times nowadays, that when we, when we visit an organization, we meet with the CI team, we meet with the application teams, and the CI teams, they don't own developer productivity. They, they own things like, auditability, security compliance. So what they often do, right, they, they, they add tons of checks, right, to achieve their goals, which dramatically increases CI build time, right? But they're not, they're not incentivized by making CI builds faster, right? They, they're incentivized by maximum security compliance. So they sometimes go over the top when it comes to that. And, and there is no balance in the organization to say, hey, developer productivity is a thing, right? That is something that needs to be taken into account when we make a, a, a certain um, decisions about doing additional checks, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and, and we see this all over the place. And there's frustration and there's friction between those teams. But, uh, 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 but because there is no clear responsibility, right, it doesn't get resolved. So, uh, and a very, very, very important point is, most developers want to work in an environment that enables them to work at their full potential, right? Uh, there might be a few who kind of enjoy an unproductive environment, right? And, uh, uh, but that's, that's the exception. And very important for organizations is 
that if they cannot provide such an environment, they will lose talent. Right? There, is this, uh, there is this story uh, where I think a Netflix executive is talking with an executive of a Wall Street, Street bank, and, and the guy from the Wall Street bank said, hey, if we only had your quality of developers, right, then we could compete completely differently when it comes to, to, to software. And, and the Netflix I said, well, guess where we got our developers from, right? We, we recruited them. We went to the East Bay, we did, uh, uh, sorry, to the East Coast, we did Java user group events, right? And, and to show them, hey, this is where you can live up to your potential, right? And that, that is a key decision maker for many developers, right, where they want to work. That's, that's very important. And losing talent is the worst that can happen to your developer productivity. And from a business point of view, right, developer productivity improvements provide such a high leverage for every dollar invested into software development. Most money goes into the, the, the salaries of the software developers, right, and they are hard to find. So uh, the leverage you can get is, is, is tremendous. And, and if, you, if you don't do that, you have a significant competitive disadvantage, right? All business innovation nowadays needs to be funneled through software. And innovation is blocked, business innovation is blocked if you're not productive enough with your software development. We, we all know that, right? So it's, it's almost crazy, right, that, that if you don't do a dedicated effort to, to improve your productivity. Every other industry is investing into productivity, right? Software, uh, software development teams have to do the same thing. Right and and the challenges for an organizational change. So that's interesting when we uh, uh, when we do surveys, right? So for example, uh, and we sometimes do this together with our partners, right? In the ecosystem, let's say they need to make a case. Hey, we need to modularize our code base more, right? And and need to reduce the number of flaky tests, right? What developers tell us, they very often struggle how to make the case to the manager why this is a necessary investment, and and if they cannot make a clear case it's postponed, it's not addressed, right? Uh, uh, and a big part of making the case is, is quantifying the benefits, right? If you're not able to do that, to some degree, it's hard for a decision maker to say, okay, make, please make that investment decision, right? So what we often see, let's say an organization is not in a good shape and developers are very unhappy with how the tool chain works. Let's say you now do a dedicated effort and you improve, let's say, build and test time by 20% and reduce flaky tests by 25%. If you just make a survey with the developers, they will still say, oh, I'm not happy, it should be better. But if you, but if you can quantify, if you can say, yes, I know we're not in paradise yet, but this is actually an improvement we make, right? It, it, it completely changes the conversations if you can quantify, if you can, change, if you can show progress based on numbers and not just on gut feel and, and things like that. Very fast feedback cycles are important. I think everyone attending uh, the webinar, 50% of the people already said that's our biggest problem. Also here, it's very important to make the case, to look at, to look at it in depth, why it is so important, and, and to, have, to have a very strong argument. So one thing I found fascinating when I saw that the first time is faster builds improve the creative flow. We worked with organization and they had many teams, so, but we just look at team one and team two at this organization, and one team had 11 developers and the other team had six developers. And the build time of team one was four minutes and of team two, one minute. Build and test time, right? So four minute build and test time, people, you know, they, they, they do not go to the CEO or say, hey, I cannot work here anymore probably. But the very interesting thing you can see is that the team two has twice as many local builds and test run than team one. So they're much, they're much more often asked for feedback. They have a much better dialogue with the tool chain, right? And even though in four minutes is not a terrible build time, right? Probably if we would get the build time down to three minutes, right? We would see a higher number of local builds and a healthier dialogue with the tool chain and a more creative process for those developers, right? So, so that is, and once you see the number, you are like, wow, that, that's very interesting, right? So, so even if you're, if your, if your builds are not considered slow, right, getting them down from four minutes to three minutes makes a big difference. Getting them down from one minute to 45 seconds makes a difference. So that is the creative flow. But of course, there is another more obvious uh, effect of build time. It's waiting time, right? So builds that are faster than 10 minutes cause significant waiting time because 
those are usually builds and tests where developers are idle and are waiting for the build to finish. It's not worth to switch to a different task very often. And the aggregated cost of waiting is surprisingly high, even for very fast builds, right? So, so we mentioned that team with six developers, right? And thousand builds per week. We managed just with a, with a little bit of investment to get their build time down from one minute to 0.6 minutes. And for this team, this reduced waiting time meant 44 more engineering days per year, right, for the whole team. That's a very significant number. One minute to 0.6 minutes doesn't sound very sexy, but if you do the math, right, and if you have 1,000 builds per week, it's actually very significant, right? And, and if you have longer build time, let's say you, you get it down 100 people team, right, nine minutes to five minutes, it, it, it can increase productivity by per developer multiple hours per day, right? And we've seen that. And one thing to keep in mind is that an unreliable tool chain substantially increases waiting time. So if you have a lot of flaky tests or weird issues with the build, the average time for feedback cycle uh, uh, increases, right, uh, uh, significantly. Okay, then just let, make the build longer than 10 minutes and no, no, no one is waiting anymore and we are all fine, right? Obviously, that, that is probably not a good idea. Uh, as build time increases, people switch more and more to do different tasks while the build is running. And now the cost of context switching has to be paid. When, not, not always, right? When I, when I, let's say, I finish a feature, right, and then I fire off the build and everything is green, everything is fine, I don't have to pay the cost of context switching. But whenever this build fails and I have to go back, right, then I have to pay that cost. And what we see usually is that about 20% of all builds fail, right? So this is a very frequent thing, right? That the build fails and you have to figure out what is going on, right? Or you have to go back to the previous task, right? When, when you had to trigger a build as an intermediate step, you want to see, is that so far working, right? And if everything is green, you continue with the work, right? And context switching often costs 10 to 20 minutes, right? It depends, of course, but it's a significant number of time. You have to pay for that. And it has to be paid twice, when you start with a new task, and then when you have to go back to the, to the previous task. And again, an unreliable tool chain substantially increases this cost. Let's say you have a flaky test, so your build fails, you have to go back, you figure out, oh, it's flaky, everything was okay, then you have to go back to the new task, you, you get the idea. So, one important aspect of longer build times is, uh, 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 it makes them harder to debug. Why? So, when build takes longer, the change set of a single push does increase. When you have a build time of 20 minutes, the granularity of what you're trying to push through the pipeline increases, right? It's just because it's just too expensive to do it too fine-grained. But the bigger the change set is, the longer it will take an average to debug a failure. Obviously, there are more changes that might be responsible for a breakage, right? And this affects local build as well as the resulting CI builds. Right? And, and when CI build takes longer, then the number of contributors with changes per CI build increases. For example, for the master build, right? more stuff gets merged in before the master build starts again. We have seen extreme examples right, with large C++ code bases where the build time was 20 hours. Right? So that, that meant they could run one build a day. Right? So now imagine they had 400 developers in the team was a big uh, 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 monorepo. Now imagine, right, this build fails. They had, I don't know, 200 commits in that build. Now have fun uh, finding out which of those changes broke the build, right? And, and in that, the other thing is, if the master build takes longer, this also increases the likelihood of merge conflicts. If you have a master build that takes an hour, right, then uh, uh, you only have, let's say, if you're all in one time zone, you have, uh, 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 you, you only have eight, eight opportunities a day to get your, your, your changes merged in, and everyone is trying to do that, right? So the other thing that, that is important is that when you have a failure, the time fixing the failure is growing exponentially with the time it takes to detect it. That, that there, is a lot of, there are a lot of studies around that. Of course, it's not a smooth curve, curve but, but in general, uh, that is the case, right? And it depends on things we have already mentioned, Right, uh, like uh, the change sets get 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 bigger. It, 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 the context switching plays a role, a and that that is that is that is a huge incentive for having faster feedback cycles. But what we're saying, what we're seeing right now, in many many organizations, 
uh, and that is that I think it's it's a it's a huge problem, right? So so I can share one story, right? There was an organization, they had uh, they had build times of uh, twenty five to thirty minutes, and the developers right, just they, they had a they had a Maven. Uh, they have a Maven repo with I don't know four five hundred submodules, right? And and that, so a developer running just a normal build, compile and run the tests and do the other checks and source code generation, whatever, took twenty five to thirty minutes. So so they complained to the VP, the developer, saying we cannot work like that anymore, right? It just uh, uh, and and then and then they had, they had a task force, and the task force tried hard and they they got the build uh, 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 faster by. Five minutes or so, right? Good, it, it worthwhile effort, but it was still they want to get it down to five minutes, right, uh, and not to twenty minutes or something like that. So, what they decided to do is they, they they did some magic and they said, well, stop running tests locally, right? And now the build time is under five minutes, right? But uh, you pay a high price if you do that, right? If you if because of growing build times you push running the test to a later point in the life cycle, right, the exponentiality is hitting you even harder, right, because now you, you, you have a long running build, plus you execute it at a later time, so, so the, the, the time to detect the defect is increasing and exponentially is the time increasing to fix the defect. Uh, and, and it also increases the change set side again as it becomes even more inconvenient to get feedback. So we see this all happening all over the place. So it's, it's kind of ironic, right? Everything is investing into CI and CD products, but the actual process of continuous integration is going in the opposite direction. And we have to change that. It's often a vicious circle. Long builds increase change set size. Change set size increases debugging time. Debugging time increases the average time until a build is successful, right? And that increases the likelihood of merge conflicts. That's something you might be confronted with. Right. And, and so some people say, well, for us, the situation is not quite like that. So does all this apply to every project? Right. I would say projects with relatively fast builds, they pay a high waiting time cost. Whether developers complaining about it or not. Right. If you do the math, it's, it will be significant. Right. And, and projects with long builds, they pay both high waiting time and context switching costs. And obviously, if you if you very small, let's say if you're a small company and you have a low number of com committers, you, you will be less affected by merge conflicts than when you have many people committing, obviously, right? So, but some people say, hey, we, we're doing microservices. We don't have those problems, right? Uh, uh, so let's say building and testing a single repository is relatively fast because you have many repositories. There is still a lot of incentive to make it faster. We talked about it. But the, you're now in a challenging situation. The producer build no longer detects that the consumer is broken. That's the nice thing. When you have a single build, right, the producer runs the build and then, oh, module 10 is broken, right, uh, by my change. That is no longer happening. So the consumer has to figure out why they're broken and the triaging is often very time consuming and, and complex, right. Once the consumer figures out, oh, my build is not broken, uh, it's about, oh, dependency one, two, three have changed. I did some changes. What exactly is responsible? So the integration problems are often discovered at a late stage. And that is the price you pay with that approach. So our recommendation is don't go crazy with uh, 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 the granularity of, of, your, of your repositories, right? Otherwise, you run into, into serious issues because of that and, and, and other challenges. So long feedback cycle time is poisonous, and developers might look for a different job if, if things get too much out of hand. OK, so that is, the, that is the suffering, right, that many of us have to live with or whose job it is to improve it, right? So how to improve? fast feedback cycles. And there is one technology, one concept that is uh, uh, essential uh, to uh, make builds faster, and that is build caching. And before I go into that, uh, I want to have another poll and ask what build tools are you using? So let's share the results. So 50% Cradle, 40% Maven, 18% uh, 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 Cradle and Maven, 70% other. The concept is the same. The solutions we are showing, they will work for Gradle and Maven. So the concept of a build cache w was introduced to the Java world by, by Gradle in 2017. It's available for Maven and Gradle. We will eventually work to also make it available to other build systems in the JavaScript ecosystem, etc. Probably not for Ant. 
Maybe we should ask in the next poll who is using AND. That would be interesting. Uh, but very, so, so I, I know 50% uh, uh, said they're using Gradle and, and, and some of you might be already very familiar for the con with the concept of a build cache. So, so please, uh, 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 sorry if, I, uh, if I'm repeating something you already know, but I think it's, a, but we see a lot of confusion about what a build cache is. People often say, well, build cache we use at a factory or something like that, right? And it's, it's completely complementary to a dependency cache. Right? A dependency cache caches binaries right, that represent different source repositories. So, so basically your artifactory cache is Maven Central and then your local dependency cache of your Gradle build tool or your Maven caches those binaries. Right? And they represent different source repositories. And it can, can be used to accelerate things, but, but uh, that, that's not the main, the main point. Right? The main point is to go against a stable release from a particular source repository. Right? A build cache accelerates building a single source repository. That's the purpose of a build cache. And it, it caches build actions, for example, Gradle tasks or Maven goals. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So all those build actions, a Gradle task or Maven goal, they have inputs and they have outputs. And the concept of a build cache is when the inputs have not changed, the outputs can be reused from a previous run. So Cradle has a, has a form of that with the up-to-date checking, right? But if you think about it, the up-to-date checking only reuses output from the previous build when you don't do a clean build, right? So, so in that respect, Cradle has some form of build caching already in it since, whatever, 2010, right? But, but this build cache doesn't go over time. So when you switch between branches, right? When you, when you build branch A and then you switch to branch B, you build branch B, all the build results from branch A are gone if you don't use a build cache, right? And then the up-to-date checking is not helping you. And when you do clean CI builds and ephemeral CI builds, it, it's also not helping you, right? But the key idea is when the inputs have not changed, the output can be reused from a previous run over, and the previous, and, and the previous run doesn't mean to be the last run, it can be the run from two days ago, right? And of course, it can be reused from multiple, across machines, right? So to give you an example, if you look at the compile task, the inputs are the source files, the compile class path, the Java version, the compiler configuration. And what we're doing when we, when we, when we, when we do caching is that we, we hash all that input. So we, it's not timestamp based, it's content based, we hash it. And out of those hashes, we create a key that uniquely represents that input. And then we ask the cache, do you have output for that input? If not, then we run the build action, take the output, put it in the cache. If the build cache has output for that input, we, we get the output from the cache, unzip it into the build output directory, the, build, the create a build directory or the Maven target directory, and don't run the build action. In this case, the compile task. And what is very important to understand, it's a generic feature. It not just works for compile, it's particularly effective for avoiding test execution. Testing, the inputs are source files, runtime class path, etc. Right, the output are the test results. And if the inputs haven't changed, right, we, the, the cache gives us the, the test results without actually running the tests. But to be clear, caching is effective for multi-module builds, right? Builds with a single module will only moderately benefit from the cache, right? But as soon as you have a few modules, you will get significant benefits from the cache. And as your modules growing, that will, that will even increase. But if you have five modules, fine, right? It's absolutely worthwhile. It will be spectacular, probably, the results you will get from applying the build cache. And uh, I will talk more about, you know, examples where we show the savings uh, uh, in, in a couple of minutes. So, but I want to explain a little bit more why the cache is effective. So, so you, have, you have a multi-module build, let's say five modules. All those modules need to be built. Let's say you have a generate sources, action, compile, check style, compile the tests, run the tests, right? So just look at those five actions, right? And, and now let's say you change, you do a change in source main Java in module five, right? And let's say no other module depends on module five. Now, when you run the build, whether you run a clean build or whether you run a CI build, right, uh, on, a, on a new agent, it doesn't matter. Module one to four 
all the outputs of all those tasks are retrieved from the cache. They don't need to be rerun. Only the module 5 actions, because you, you changed the source code, right? Uh, well, the generate sources task probably doesn't need to be run. That, that, that doesn't take it. But anyhow, you need to recompile, run check style, compile test, and run a test. But it's only one fifth of the build actions that otherwise need to be run. So, so if, if everything is evenly distributed, your build will be five times faster. Another example would be you just change source test Java of module 5. No other module depends on module 5. Then you only need to rerun compile tests and tests, right? Even in module 5, most of the stuff is now up to date. So there might there are other scenarios. Let's say you do a change in source main Java of module 5 that does not change the API of module 5. In that case, you need to rebuild module 5. But for module 4, you don't need to run checksile again. You don't need to generate the source and compile. What you need to do, because the runtime class path has changed, you need to uh, uh, recompile the tests and uh, uh, you need to rerun the tests. Uh, so that, that, but that's a fraction of what otherwise is necessary. And if you change module 5 and the, the API of module 5 has changed, then you also need to recompile module 4. But all the other stuff is, is uh, up to date and can be retrieved from a cache. So, of course, let's say you have a module 1 and every other module depends on module 1, then, uh, and you change the API of a module, then the majority of build actions need to be executed. Still, not all of them, but the majority. But those changes are usually the exception, right? And in average, you have a huge number of tasks, right, per build that does not need to be executed. So, as already said, even with only a few modules, a cache significantly reduces build and test times. What we see with larger multi-module builds is that often 50% of the modules are leaf modules. So no other modules depend on that module. And for those modules, the build time is reduced by approximately 1 divided by n, with n being the number of modules. Right? So if you have 100 modules, like let's say the Spring Boot project, right, then you, you have approximately 100th of the build time right? when you change such a leaf module. It's, it's, the effects are tremendous of a build cache. We work with LinkedIn, Airbnb, right, Tableau, Big Banks, right? So we see, we see that in action, right, every day, right? So we're not speculating here. We have enough evidence. We can really say if you have, if you have a multi-module build, build cache will, be, will have spectacular results. Checking the inputs and downloading and unpacking the cache items introduces some overhead, right? So, but it's often very small compared to the benefit, but it's something you need to monitor. To show you some examples, right, when we started introducing the cache for our CI builds, the average CI build time has improved by a factor of 80%, right? So the 80% faster in average, right, for the Cradle project itself. When you plug in a build cache, right, you, you should see some results uh, out of the box, but then of course you have to, there is a lot of things you can do to optimize the cache effectiveness. We'll talk about that later. Many of you know the Spring Boot project, it's built with Maven, right, and running compile and unit tests on my machine takes about 20 minutes, right? And when we just plugged in Gradle Enterprise with the, with, the, with the build cache for Maven, just plugging it in, not immediately, right? The, the fully cached build uh, was six times faster, right? And with some optimizations and later versions of Gradle Enterprise, we now, we get it now under two minutes, right? 10 times faster when you have a fully cached build. Usually, you, you don't run fully cached builds, right? Uh, because you actually have a change that you want to run, but with 100 modules that Spring Boot has, many builds will be cr much closer to the 2 minutes than to the 20 minutes. What's important to understand, usually you have two instances of the cache, right? You have a local cache and a remote cache. And the local cache is used by developers for your non-committed changes. It's, it's very effective, right, when you switch between branches. For Maven, anyhow, because you always have to run a clean build, but usually the changes that are, that are published to the local cache are not shared with other developers. And then you have a remote cache that is usually only written to by CI and those, this build output is shared with all the developers. And of course with the other CI agents, right? So the remote cache makes CI builds much faster as well as developer builds. And, and a classical example would be if you do source code generation, right, and developers come to work in the morning and they, and they pull from CI, right, and then they all have to generate the same sources, right? Well, with the build cache, CI has already done that. Why don't immediately get the, get the output, right? So, 
Okay, so the local build cache is a, is a cache directory on your local machine and uh, speeds up develop single developer uh, builds or build agent builds when they preserve the state. And, uh, and we have the remote build cache, which is a service that you need to install in your organization, right? If you use Gradle Enterprise, it provides such a service. They can be configured so that they replicate from each other. You can have multiple nodes, right? Remote nodes so that, they, that they're close to your different uh, locations. So that, that is a very a thing you can make very scalable. And a very important part of the build cache. So this is, those are, we just got this uh, numbers from a customer of ours a couple of months ago, once they started to introduce the build cache their agent availability was much better. They had about 40% of CI builds were queued, right, in average. And then as they started to introduce the cache and started to optimize the cache, the first time ever they had a situation where not a single CI build needs to be queued. So in terms of CI availability and also costs of CI, a build cache is usually very impactful. So if you want to learn more, uh, for Maven, uh, yeah, just Google for Maven build cache and it will take you this page uh, for Gradle. There's a very good tutorial how to get started with caching. If you're not using cache yet, not using the remote cache yet, absolutely get going with that, right? Even very small projects, right? Like let's say SLF4J. Uh, to, to build and run a test for SLF, uh, SLF4J takes 30 seconds. But 25 to 30 seconds. If you do it with a cache, you will get fully cached down to 10 seconds. And if you run this many times, it's worth it, right? So, so absolutely, right, build cache. There's nothing that, that can give you the same, the same performance improvements uh, uh, than a build cache, right? Just because the fastest thing is not to do things at all. So the other thing I wanna show you is something we're working on right now. It's not released yet, it's distributed testing. So what you can see here, here we have a Gradle build for Maven, it will work a similar way. You can tell Gradle, hey Gradle, run the tests that I still need to run, right? Run it in a distributed way. And the way we, we are doing this will be, it's a hybrid approach, right? So you can, you can tell us, hey, you can use so and so many processes locally, and then use so and so many agents remotely, or ask a service how many remote agents are available. So in this case, we run the tests with two local agents and we have an integration with Jenkins where we ask Jenkins, hey, how many build agents do you have for me to run my tests, right? And Jenkins said, hey, I have two for you. So now we have two local processes and two remote agents. And what you can, well, you don't see that much except the timer uh, uh, running 10 seconds, 11 seconds. So what you can see here, right, the build took 17 seconds, otherwise it would have taken 34 seconds. And if you, wanna, if you want to have even faster builds, just throw more resources at the problem. So we're super excited about that. It's directly integrated with the build system, so it works for, for Gradle and Maven just by running the build. Use the resources on your local machine as well as remote agents. And particularly, it's so convenient to use for local changes, right? You don't need to somehow go via CI, just run your build and it will run the tests remote as well as local. A lot of the secret sauce will be to, to make it really low overhead. Uh, the distribution will be very fine grained. So, so it will be per test call. So even if all your tests live in one module, right, we will distribute them test class by, by test class. Oh, this, this is a typo. It's not test calls, but test classes. Smart scheduling for maximum utilization. So you don't need to do any sharding yourself. High number of resources can be used and it's even configurable based on the, on the type of build if wanted. So there is a question, will it be possible to execute whole tasks on Jenkins? So at the moment, the, so our first step into the whole distributed terrain is uh, uh, just focus on a test and make it more fine-grained than per task, right? Uh, so, so this is just, we work just for tests and, and the distribution unit will not be a test, but a test class or method. What we have already spiked and what we will address in some form probably next year is how, how you can then, besides the tests, how you can run any type of task or Maven goal uh, uh, in a distributed way, right? So that is not what this feature is about. That would be uh, 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 the next step, what we will be working on. Uh, we focus on tests at the moment because uh, for two reasons. Uh, uh, they are very special problem. That's often where most of the time is going and when you distribute things via tasks, you, you rely to a degree on how well is your code modularized, right? Otherwise you have 
a super big task, right? A super big module that is executing 10,000 tests, right? And then you, 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 your unit of distribution is 10,000 tests, right? With, with, with this approach, it doesn't matter, right? Because we distribute not per task, but per test class. But nonetheless, the, this is also something we are working on and you can expect next year. Probably, right? It's not scheduled yet, but that, that is something. If you ask me now, that, that would be my prediction. We talked a lot about why data, what you can do to make things faster in terms of acceleration technologies, but it's also extremely important that you can actively improve your performance. So what, what I mean with that is performance regressions are easily introduced, right? Infrastructure changes, right? Binary management, CI agent configuration, how the caching is set up, right? People introduce new annotation processes or change version of annotation process and have no idea that the compile time increases by a factor of five, right? Build logic, configuration settings, right? Compiler settings, memory settings, code refactorings can affect, right? How performant the build is, right? New office locations. So at, what we see at the moment is, what happens today with most regressions is they're either unnoticed, they're noticed but unreported because people, or they don't have, a, have a, had a lot of luck in reporting regressions, right? They're reported but not addressed because the root cause is hard to detect, especially with flaky issues and the overall impact and priority cannot be determined, right? If I say, oh, my build is slow, right? Uh, uh, let's say to the build team, how do you then prioritize that, right? If you had data to see, wow, 50 developers are affected by that performance problem, it would be uh, pretty easy to prioritize that. If you don't have that data, it's hard for you to make a call. And then often they get escalated after they have caused a lot of pain and that's the only way they really get addressed. Then the problem gets fixed after it has already wasted a lot of time and caused a lot of frustration. So, so result is the average build time is much higher than necessary and continuously increasing, right? And the only way to have high performing builds, right, is you need analytics and you need data, right? Uh, uh, even with distributed test execution and build caching, right, there's so much that can go wrong and it can affect performance. You need data to optimize your tool chain, right? Uh, uh, like you need data to, to optimize the performance of your application. Right. And, and the key thing is, whenever a bill is executed, locally or remote, you need to capture data and, and then you can, when the data is good and comprehensive, you can often easily detect the root cause for the problem instead of reproducing the problem and the problem can be detected early. And having all the data from every build allows you to prioritize the decisions. It's the only way, right, to have a performant tool chain is to have, to have insights into the tool chain. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? But hardly any organization has it. So I just want to show you very quickly what I mean with that, right? So how this could look like, right? However, you, well, this is Gradle Enterprise, right, uh, uh, which offers such a data collection, however you achieve that, right? You need the data and you need the analytics, right? To have an effective tool chain. So here, what you can see here, we have executed 110,000 builds in the last, uh, in the last seven days. And let's say if Hans is always complaining about builds, right? Well, I haven't run one <laughs> in the last seven days, right? You can say, oh, my builds are always failing. You, you, can, you can look for it. You can say, okay, what's the situation with Hans? Okay, he had a few failing builds, but uh, right, let me, and then you could look at what, what is the reason why they failed, right? So, so, so uh, let's do this again. You, you can go to any build, and that's what we call a build scan, right? And then you have very comprehensive data, right? What was the infrastructure set up, right? How was the build configured? What dependencies were used, right? Uh, uh, deep dive into every aspect of the performance of the build, how, you know, memory situation, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and with that, with that, you can now effectively, when someone say my build is slow, right? They send you a build scan, you can now see, oh, is it because of dependency download time? Is it because of whatever, right? This is key. Okay, um, the next point, many people describe that as, as their biggest pain point is uh, reliability issues, right? And so, so and that is a, it is a huge pain of frustration, right? Uh, including flaky tests, right? So how can you make your developers more productive by either let them endure fewer incidents with the tool chain and if there is an incident, provide better support. So there are two types of failures. Well, three. Uh, one is a verification failure, right? So two, two different types of tool chain failures, right? So 
uh, verification failure is a syntax error detected by compilation, code style violation detected by check style, misbehavior in a code detected by a JUnit test, right? And then you have non-verification failures, flaky tests, binary repository down, out of memory exception when running the build. And then you have slow builds, right? They're not strictly a failure, but, but uh, uh, obviously a problem, right? You need to help people with. And sometimes maybe only a few builds are slow, and then you need to figure out why exactly those, right? So, and triaging and triaging and prioritization is often very difficult. So for various reasons, right? So one is non-verification failures mask as a verification failure. For example, a flaky test, right? Developer looks at, oh, my test failed. Other, less common, but still they happen, right? Verification failure mask as a non-verification failure. Let's say a snapshot dependency issue, right? You, you, you think something must be wrong with the build. It has worked five minutes ago, now the build is not working, right? And you think it's a non-verification failure, but actually a new snapshot dependency version was picked up, right? So, and then when you have non-verification failures, it might be unclear, is it caused by a bug in a Gradle or Maven plugin, or is it a user misconfiguration, right? Hard to figure out very often. Many issues are flaky and hard to reproduce. So, uh, uh, and the general problem is, you do not have enough information available to help efficiently, right? No data for local builds is collected and only limited data for CI builds, the console log, right, and the test reports. So that's why most troubleshooting sessions begin with a game of 20 questions, right? And no one, uh, and people are afraid of that. That's why they often don't report issues. Uh, and person asking for help often doesn't know what contact is important, right? Helpers can burn out helping. It's often uh, not what people want to do the whole day, but when it's inefficient, it consumes a big amount of their time. Right? And, and one big problem is root cause analysis is often impossible without the helper trying to reproduce the problem. Right? And the impact analysis is not data driven. Right? So when someone is complaining about a reliability issue, how important should it be to fix it? Right? So uh, again, same with performance, you need to capture data from every build run, local and CI. It's the only way to effectively diagnose flaky issues uh, and, and the data but the data has to be comprehensive to allow for root cause analysis without reproducing. And having all the data allows for impact analysis, right? So, so again, one way to get this data is Gradle Enterprise. You can install it on premises. You can easily connect it with all your Gradle and Maven builds. And, and it will send a very comprehensive set of data that you can even extend with your own custom data so that you can effectively figure out the root cause for issues you have when it comes to toolchain reliability. And it's, it's a game changer once you have that. You could think about creating your own solution, right? Uh, writing plugins that extract all the data from the build, pump it to some data store. However you do it, you need the data of each and every build, local and CI. Otherwise, you cannot effectively deal with reliability issues. And already talked about Build scans or something similar is often your only friend, right? When you try to help someone and have to fix an issue. We were uh, 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 actually uh, uh, ex trying out the build cache with, with a large Maven build uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at a prospect. Uh, they have a, I don't know, 500 submodule Maven build and, and huge build time issues. So, and, and then we were, we, were, we were installing the build cache. And, and when they did the first experiment, they were very disappointed. They said, hey, the build with the build cache takes five times longer than a build without it. And we were like, that, that cannot be, right? And, and, and remember, we were talking with the build experts there, their build team, right, that really understand their build infrastructure. So we said, something must be different between the two build runs, right? And they said, no, it's exactly the same. And we are, they almost got annoyed, right, by us questioning, basically, whether the builds are really run the same way. But then we said, hey, let's look at the build scans, right? And, and then we looked at the infrastructure uh, uh, section and we could see, well, the build without the build cache is using 128 threads. The build with the build cache is only using one thread. And they were very surprised by that. They expected that not to be the case. But they had some weird configuration issues, right? And they made a hypothesis. They made an assumption that the builds are run the same way. But without having the data that tells you exactly how many threads have been used, you, it's, it's hard, right? Human beings are, are not as good uh, in, in interpreting what Maven or Gradle does than, than the tool itself. So rather capture the data from the tool than rely on speculative you know, 
uh, assumptions from people. No, the build is running the same way. I haven't changed anything. Uh, no, my memory is one gigabyte. Well, maybe you have misspelled Maven or Cradle opts, right? And your memory is actually only 100, 128 megabyte. You get the idea. But even better than helping people with incidents is to avoid incidents, right? And, and one thing I want to show you is, so developers very often struggle, especially with failing CI builds, uh, to understand, is that my change or is it something else that has changed? I, don't, I do not know why this build has failed. So, so even, even when it's a verification failure, they don't have enough they cannot reason enough about it, so they escalate it or they file a, a support ticket. So one beautiful thing you can do when you capture the data of every build all the time, first of all, here's the failing CI build, right? So we look at the build scan and it gives us a lot of information, but we still don't know why it has failed. But what we know is, hey, it has succeeded previously and we think nothing has changed. So let's say locally I run the build with exactly the same commit ID and it worked. So when you have all the data you can compare. And now we compare the builds and we can see oh there's a different independencies. The CI build was using version 1.6 and the local build was using version 1.5. Without such a capability it's so hard for developers to reason about. So they, they have file issues or they delete every cache in the universe, right? And then run the build again to see if it's now working. You get the idea. Now they can click on 1.6 and they can see, ah, there is a dynamic dependencies and the CI build just picked up a later version, right? So no incident will be filed. The other thing I wanted to show is how can you proactively do performance optimizations and how can you proactively uh, do reliability improvements, right? So, so one thing we can do when we have all the data is to do a failure analysis. Here we uh, analyze failures, I think over the whole history of, of data that we have collected, and we distinguish between, you can look at all failures, verification and non-verification failures, right? So we classify them, we analyze the failures and classify them as verification or non-verification failures. So now, you can look, and all the non-verification failures are reliability issues, right? So you can now look at some of them. For example, we have an interesting one here, this one here. When we look at this particular failure, where we can see, wow, this, this has affected quite a few builds. So it, it didn't occur, then it occurred, and then it mostly went away. So, and you can now reason about it. You can see, okay, 13 users were affected by it. All of those failures only happened when doing local builds, 500, you know, and, and none of them when, when doing CI builds. So this is, a, this is a failure that only affects local builds. So, and then, and then we looked at the timeline, we looked at a couple of other things, and then what we could find is we have removed the sub project, the announce project. The announce plugin is no longer, will no longer be in, in, in Gradle 6 at all, right? But we had many people in their build configuration assuming that this still exists, right? So, and using the nouns plugin. So our developer, we removed something and our developers always used the latest version of Gradle. And then we saw now we have a completely new type of, of build failures, right? And then we informed them and we did some communication and now almost all those failures are gone, right? But you can immediately, the beautiful thing, if you analyze the data, you can immediately see how many people are affected, what types of builds are affected. Similar with performance analysis, right? So, so for example, here we, we analyzed uh, the, the build performance of the last four weeks, right? So our average build time is two minutes and 50 seconds. Because of build avoidance, we save 16 minutes and 40 seconds per build. So if, let's say if Gradle were built with Maven without a build cache, our builds would take 20 minutes, right, in average. But then you can do interesting things like, let's say dependency downloading. In average, we spend per build a uh, uh, two seconds on dependency downloading, which is good. Our average cache overhead per build is four seconds, but, but you can do some interesting stuff. You can, you can go to our performance diagnostic board and you can say, hey, show me the last 10,000 builds uh, uh, that had, and show me and only focus on the dependency downloading time. And then we, we can now look at builds and see, wow, here we had a build where actually we spent 45 seconds on dependency downloading. So 
Now we can go to the build scan, we can go to performance, we can go to network activity and we can learn, okay, uh, we, we downloaded quite a bit of dependencies, 240 megabytes, but also the bandwidth was very slow. So let's say someone of your people complains about a slow build, slow build. very often it's, it's dependency download issues, right? So you now can actively analyze that and can see, have there, were there any downloads, how fast was the bandwidth, right? So, so again, you need the analytics to see where is interesting stuff, right, to, to dive in deeper, and then you need a comprehensive set of data to reason about the root cause for a certain behavior. Yeah, here is another example. We just got this uh, also from a customer. Uh, what you can see here is, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to read, but they, they had a new incident occurring, and only one user was affected, the CI user, the Jenkins user. So they immediately know this, this is only a CI problem, right? And, and what happened basically was that uh, the infrastructure team changed their Docker configuration and they had no idea that this was affecting and introducing errors on, on, on CI builds, right? And, and the beautiful thing is when you have the data, right, you immediately see, is, it, is that a one-off thing or is that a trend, right? You don't have to wait until things get escalated. You can proactively monitor, right? Let's say, let's say someone is having a new, a new exception. You can search. When someone is having a, an exception, you can paste the error message from the command line and we look for exceptions with similar messages to see is this a one-off thing or is this happening to, to more people. Yeah, so one of the big problems when it comes to reliability is flaky tests. So that is a, that is a problem that is affecting, I don't know an organization who doesn't have that problem, right? We're currently working on a solution, right? The plan is to release this in Q4 2019. Uh, we will keep you informed, everyone who signs, has signed up for the webinar with new features we, 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 we're releasing. So uh, we, we're super excited about that, right? Uh, uh, that, that is a huge problem. We had to create a custom solution, right, for our own engineers, and, and, and we are now super excited that we can productize something that, that, that can really help with that. Yeah, so if you're interested in learning more, right, we, we, do, we do a hands-on workshop where we basically have similar content like in this presentation, but we have, we do this together with labs and exercises, right, uh, uh, that you can do to, to really get, get, a, get a deeper understanding about uh, uh, how to solve certain of those problems, right. So if you're interested in that, uh, you, can, you can sign up with, with this URL in a follow-up email, we will also mention that, right. So, uh, yeah, more resources on that topic you can find here. We're working also on a book called Developer Productivity Engineering, where we hope that we will release the rough draft in, in uh, several weeks, right? So we will also inform you uh, via email about that. And then, so, and then my, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. Are any more questions from the audience? Is it possible to run tests only for code that you touched? Something like build optimization to speed up build? Yes, that is what the build cache is giving you, but of course not with, so, so if you think about it, right, if you have, if you have a multi-module build, you have exactly that effect. You change module 10, there are, there, are, there are no dependency on module 1 to 9, and then we will not run the tests for those modules 1 to 9 and get the results from the build cache. So, so if you think about it, the build cache is providing you exactly that kind of incrementality, but of course, it is heavily affected by how well modularized your code is. If all the tests live in one module and all your source code live in, lives in one module, then it will not provide you that effect. Um, we, what, we, what I've never seen implemented successfully or used successfully is some incremental uh, class analysis where, where you try to figure out from the class dependency graph, right, which change in the test affects which part of the code base and then which tests need to be run. Uh, so that, that, so my recommendation is use the build cache and improve the modularization of your code then you will get, you will get the majority of those benefits from that. Running CI builds with build cache on, is it safe? Right now I do everything I can to ensure that build is clean. Yeah, it's, ab it's absolutely safe, right? Some of the organ organizations with some of the most critical software stacks in the world using a build cache, right? The build cache is safe because uh, it only works for the tasks that are declared cacheable and where the input is properly described. So absolutely, 
you can you, you should use it on CI. We Cradle is delivered that way. I don't want to scare you, but I, I don't think we have ever had any issues with that. And 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 I mean Google is using build caches, right? Airbnb, big banks, right? It's it's uh, absolutely safe. Yes. But the key thing is then also have monitoring in place that if there are issues, you are able to debug them. Is there a good resource for best practices for these variables we have discussed? Guidance on the architecture principles. Uh, we're working on it. We have some resources. Uh, uh, this is work in progress. We will, we will keep you up to date. Yeah, there's quite an interesting discussion about distributed builds. Uh, will distributed testing be an enterprise feature? Yes. It will be, uh, it will be an enterprise feature, yes. It will work for Gradle and for Maven, so we, 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 it's, it lives on a different uh, uh, level. And it goes together with flaky test detection. Okay, someone else said their biggest problem is build immutability, right, uh, uh, in terms of what other meant. So that is something, uh, is a good point, right? I think the practice of build caching will also push you towards build immutability, because uh, I could show you amazing things you can do with the data to, to, uh, to discover uh, Jake to discover volatile input, right? So you can, uh, so build immutability and build caching are uh, uh, close friends. Put it, let's put it like that, right? And so uh, we can definitely help you with that. Thanks to everyone. We appreciate your time. Uh, please contact us on cradle.com if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye.